Who's here? What's going on? <laughs> Don Gould himself has decided that this project is so important that he would make the trip from Pennsylvania. Yeah, Pennsylvania, yeah. Philly area. Yep. Um, here to Dayton, Ohio. Uh, Mike's 2019 ZX-10R has been sitting here anxiously awaiting this moment. Um, we're, uh, we haven't run it on the dyno. We will make a stock baseline run, of course, but we're taking everything apart right now uh, because we're going to need to log some data. And one of the best way to do that on a mo modern bike is with a power commander. It tells us a whole lot of things. It tells us our throttle position, tells us our engine RPM, and it's just easier. So. Before we make any runs, we'll clear the map out of this so we don't alter anything, and then uh, get all the get all the data set up and let Don do his work. See you in a minute. Okay, hold here and here on the sides on this, and it flips up. Never done that before. You have a little, uh, a little uh, slotted connector here. You, the line goes in, and that, and it gets locked down. Which this one won't even work without the uh, without the plug in. But you just have to pull this up, and that'll come unplugged. Here we have everything that we need to install the power commander. We want to run this back and around the battery. Pull this off and disconnect the battery here. These are instructions. We're professionals. We still look at them. Think about that. <laughs> I envision that going right up through here. Going around the side of the battery. Yeah, and then we've got to get, we've got to pause it here. Yeah, the TPS. Look at that. Look how much easier we can get that through. So nice. Look at that. That's going to throw the ground on here. Um, yeah, we your position sensor. You want to uh, you yeah. want to go ahead and plug those in, and I'll. Uh, so we do have the gear position sensor we got to unplug, and then a couple other. I'll work back here, so we're not tripping over each other. Should be on the third third row. Got three pins in. Oh, I see it. Wow, that's very. Yeah, uh, yeah there's a purple and white, but there's also a purple in yes. the center. Yeah. Figures, uh, that's okay. We can fix it. Listen, no cheating. Your what average you your average guy isn't gonna know what you just did there. Sure. <laughs> All right. Well, in these connectors here, there's there's a locking system. I love these connectors. These are my favorite. So this is the way they normally are. The, the white tabs here are flush. And to release the pins to pull them out, the big tab, you can take a fingernail or a small screwdriver and you push it, and these pop up right here. And then you can actually just that's pull, what, pull the terminal right out. That's what unlocks the pin mm -hmm. to allow you to pull the wire back. Now if you decide to do it this way, put the wire back in the spot it came out of, which is pin number 20 yep. on the connector. But this will give us we are going to posi tap into this and this will give us a little bit more room to be able to do that yeah. um, and then when you go to put it back in make sure that it's all seated all the way up in and when you go to push these back in they should just very easily click back in place if you find that you're having to push on them there's a pin that's not seated completely uh, it should move back and forth very easily if you try to force it then you don't have a pin that's clear in you'll mess up the connectors you don't want to do that so it should just pop and click really easily of course some guys won't run a power commander there won't be any need for it once we're finished for some applications some of us like me like the like to have the ability to tune it to track so we're gonna have both we'll flash the ECU and we'll have the ability to tune the fuel at the racetrack 
for our conditions. Posit taps are the easiest thing in the world. There's a little needle and a little slotted section here. All you need to do, and then you screw this in. And all we're doing is going to have the needle just purge the uh, insulation of the wire. And then we will stick the uh, TPS wire here. I'm going to actually pull this out a little bit. I don't, all right. These, these things are just so simple and they work very well. A lot of guys don't like them. You know, I don't want a hundred of them on my bike, but one for a, a TPS is no problem at all. So you just take the wire. And what's happening is the wire will make connection with the little needle down in here. Just sort of push it in, screw that together, and it will clamp the wire. We're going to double check it. That's good. And then Don will let you let you stick it back in the pin 20 there. See that? You can hear it. You can feel them sort of click. And you can actually look right here at the tip. And you can see if it's all the way in, and then push it back. It went in real easy. All right. Good solid click there. Now we will end up cleaning this up, but for now, we're just going to push it out of the way. Said we are only putting the di the power commander on right now, simply for uh, data gathering purposes. This is the uh, gear position here. It's down here, I guess. Yeah, it should be right, right there on the edge. Let's consult the instructions. <laughs> so Don's already disconnected the lower injectors and, and plugged the harness into them. Crank position sensor. Let's make sure you hear the click. Alright. We just pulled off this line to give Don a little bit more room. Show them, uh, yeah. press it up, get your click, and there you go. Now we're ready to put the gas tank back on. Almost there. Yeah. There we go. Battery's back. We still need to put our ground back on. Go ahead and do that bit. Precisely torqued. While we're here, I'm going to go ahead and check the positive terminal. Remember that a human assembled this at some point, which means that the chances of it being loose are there. That was not, so they did a good job. Let this go down just a little bit. Plug the tank back in, controls the fuel pump, fuel gauge, various other implements of destruction. Make sure you get the right bolts back in here. I've seen people put the wrong bolts in here, they're too long. And go right through the tank. Poke a hole in the gas yeah. tank. Did you guys hear that? If you put the, the bolts back in the correct spot, if you put a bolt in here that's too long, it can you as you're tightening it, uh, it'll go in, bottom out against the gas tank. You keep tightening, pokes a hole right in your gas tank. It's a really expensive lesson to learn. And I've seen it. Oh, All I've seen months. it too. <laughs> in fact, that little yellow bike out there has it done. Yeah. And no amount of Electric or uh, Teflon tape will cause will, will stop the leak. That was my son's bike. Said uh, less, lesson learned on that one. Yeah, gotta learn some way. Might as well be by tearing up something that costs several hundred dollars. Houses. Maybe. Maybe. Great. Professionals. We have unplugged something and did not plug it back in. Yeah. Not exactly sure what. Let's make sure we got a good solid connection on the ECU. Base map inside for a stop movement. 
we're going to come over here. You can see it does have a map in it. I'm going to save that map. If I highlight the cells, that'll give me the ability to set all of these to zero. They're all zero. You tell it to set that map. Now there's all zero as if the power commander wasn't even on the bottom. Because we want to make a baseline how it was before we made any changes. So that's what we'll do now. Apples to apples. Always apples to apples. go back here I'm gonna to have to take in we we now have a tax signal so we have engine or rpm which is allow, allows us to have torque uh, looks like the max torque was 79.3 that's pretty good best horsepower 173.93 now let's go back go over here and compare our best from last time all right 171.88 I guess yeah okay so what that's basically telling us is what we're, what we're saying is, is we've got exactly the same power up, uh, up until here, a couple little dips, and that's all, that's all conditions. Um, our correction factor, well actually our correction factor right now is, it's slightly worse. So that's okay, different day, doesn't matter. All that matters is that when we're finished, we get more power. Now, I could feel that bike pulling, and Don, I saw you over there giggling. So here we've got the latest, greatest, 2019. Kawasaki's done a tremendous amount of work on this engine to make sure that it hauls butt. You feel it pulling all the way up, and then all of a sudden, you I mean, I can actually feel it. It's so bad that on the dyno, I can feel the bike stop accelerating. And if you watch the throttle position, it allowed it to climb up to 100% throttle, even though the grip position stayed at 100%. I didn't get out of it. The ECU turned it back and by the time the run was over, we read 45. Don has some interesting information here to show you what's going on. Go ahead and look at this here, Don. We got, uh, this is actually the throttle by wire map. And if you look here, we have our 100% column. 
and the numbers in the map are basically a multiplier for the accelerator position. So 100 means that we're going to take 100% and multiply it by 100%, we get 100% throttle. But here's what they do here at wide open throttle, they're actually multiplying the accelerator input by 35%. So basically, they're, they're cutting the throttles back. It just you know, didn't get yeah, we quite did, there. And there's, there's a little bit of a lag between yeah. our measurement and what Don's got. Um, so can we fix it? Yes. <laughs> we can fix it. Yeah. Looky there. Yeah. So that's one of one of the areas that, that we'll focus on um, is, is obviously de-restricting the throttles. That's probably going to be the biggest thing. Ignition is uh, restricted as well, so we'll do some playing around, see what we can find for ignition mapping. Um, Kawasaki also has some pretty crazy stuff. As a matter of fact, all the manufacturers do it because it's one of the biggest things that they faced, which is noise control. And the, the noise control is basically what's causing all of the restrictions that we have. And that's why all the bikes sort of make about the same power when they're all stock because it's a thousand cc motor. You can only make so much power before you start making too much noise and that's just a physics fundamental. So they're all making about the same numbers but the manufacturers all guard their noise abatement control. Um, I mean, this is, this is high level top secret stuff, <laughs> you know. And uh, what we were able to do is uh, actually go into the ECU and find Kawasaki's noise control software and where they switch maps and they switch throttle maps, they switch exhaust servo maps, they switch ignition maps and all sorts of stuff like that and we can actually go in and shut that entire system down and that's one of the things that's really unique with our mapping is that we actually disable that whole portion of it so we get much more consistent you know we don't have the map switching and things like that so the maps that we're editing are the maps that the bike is actually using and we're forcing it that way all the time so that's why we get such consistent results with our flashing so one of the things we want to do we don't want to badmouth any of the competition well listen we're all out here trying to do the best that we can uh, what we're going to try to emphasize as we're tuning this bike i'm going to ask don some questions some of which he can answer some of which he may not um, but it's only to show the level that he's worked so hard to get to as a programmer. Yeah, call it that. Call it that. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do you find the word hacker offensive? No. Okay. All right. So it's what we do. We <laughs> hacking without being a hack. The white hat. Exactly. Get it, get it done correctly. So uh, we're going to go ahead. What do we need to do here, Don? Uh, go ahead and just pull the ECU out. And uh, yeah. we're going to use your Mortify. Uh, we have the beta setup, which allows us to tune here now some of the bikes, which is fantastic. Uh, Don is an absolute expert. And Don can even show us on the back end how, as a tuner, I need a simple tune that allows me to get from A to B. I don't want to bring a staff of engineers with me to the track. Um, that's what the third party software does for us, but the guys who create that and the guys who understand what's actually going on in the ECU to turn it into numbers, I understand 100, right? I, you can show me the hex code for that area and I'm gonna go do it, do it, do it, do it, right? Um, which most people would. That's why we need stuff like this to be able to get the uh, the bikes to run properly and guys like Don to do it. So um, let's get started and we'll sort of set you up with a table here and we'll let you do work a little your magic and ask you some questions along the way. Right. Cool. So when you have the skills that Don has, you can take an ECU from, is that even for this bike? Yeah. No and uh, manipulate it for test purposes so that we can go in and play around and then once we're all finished we'll put the finished goods in yep. in the customer's ECU so Don the noise abatement you, you were talking about have you seen that done before as far as anybody in the motorcycle world I have not seen anybody else doing it um, it's, it's one of those things that's pretty tricky. It's amazing how much code is written just for that. I mean, there's, it's like an amazing amount of like the total code. How much of the code is the noise abatement code? Wow. And it's, it's pretty amazing. Well, we'll go ahead and give this a shot. Say any special prayers or 
just happy when it starts. Yeah. Baby on? Yeah, I'm on. Okay, so unlike a Bosch ECU, we don't really have to worry about any type of adaptation or going for a ride or any, anything of that nature. When the, the, the program you put in, it's put in, um, do we need to do anything special? Sometimes I know we'll cycle the key. Yeah, that cycling the key actually calibrated the open and close on the throttle. Um, but other than that, that's, that's all we need to do on the bike. Then we'll check it out. So what we've got here, uh, Don, Don got the throttle weights to open up in that area where they were closing, which, and you know, at 13,000, we went from 162 horsepower to 181, pretty nice gain. Now if you look, the curve is starting to fall off. We know the rev limiter is set. What do you have it set at now, Don? 14,000. Right at 14,000, and it's starting to drop off about 13. 13.2 or so. Why don't I just change this to speed? Okay. So now if you look here, um, it actually got so rich in the higher RPMs. I mean, we're looking at an air fuel ratio of <laughs> 10 point nine to one. And I don't know if you heard it, but you could actually physically hear and feel the bike get rich up top because it's just got so much fuel. But that's where we get to tune now. We have the ability to tune it. Um, and we're gonna do it in the ECU as opposed to in the Power Commander. Or do you want me to make a quick Power Commander map and import it in? Either way. Either way. I'm easy. We'll let you pick and you guys will see how we're set up here shortly. Okay guys, um, Don and I were just discussing what, what do we want to do next. Um, Don was explaining how, well, you tell Don. Yeah. This is the, the exhaust servo, um, this is the main map for the exhaust servo motor. Uh, this is one of the things that the, the factory does to actually control the noise. Of course, this is one of the first things that everybody takes off when they change the exhaust and stuff like that. But it, it's just kind of interesting to see just to the extent that they go. Basically, the exhaust servo motor is only open 5% of the way uh, from 3600 to 7000 rpm. Now this is the neutral map, but the first gear map is, is sort of similar as well. So it's just amazing what they do to actually control the noise. So, we're, so that's, since, since we're still running it, I'm just going to go ahead and, and uh, de restrict it fully as well. Uh, so it's basically the exhaust servo motor is going to be open the entire time. And that way we can actually kind of compare where they had it set factory, where we are wide open, and maybe there are some advantages that, that we'll see, maybe not, but we'll, we'll find out. Okay. And then next we're going to go to uh, fueling, try to get a little bit of that richness out up top. Go we'll we'll ahead and change the scale here. All right, guys, so what we've done here, I've actually switched our scale over from air fuel ratio to lambda. And what we've got, our, our lambda reference line is 0.88. And then what I'm going through is, is here now, and I'm giving Don a reference lambda number, number at specific RPMs because it's easier to tune in lambda 
Some people find it easier in air fuel ratio, but Don, can you just maybe give a quick glance as to why Lambda works out better for what we're doing here? Yeah, it, it, it's actually, you don't have to do any math outside of anything that you can just do in your head. So if your reference or your, your target is 0.88 Lambda and you're running 0.87 Lambda, it's 1% rich, you take away 1% fuel, it immediately gets you there. Or if you, you know, your point, point eight eight your scale or your, your target and it's a 0.95 Lambda, it's lean by 7%, you add 7% and it's immediately right there. So you don't have to break out a calculator, you don't need any fancy software or anything and, and it's just really easy. That's how I've done it, I've done it that way from, from the start and I just find it really easy to tune with. and. And now, is that an option with other third-party tuning softwares? Uh, I don't know what they report out for. for Generally, air fuel ratio. Yeah, so. yeah. All right, guys. Don and I were sitting here having a conversation that would make a lot of people's heads spin. Um, we get asked a lot, why does it take so long to, to, to be able to tune some of these new bikes? And um, Because we really know, have never know how long it's going to take. And I was telling Don, you know, my analogy would be, you know, start with a crossword puzzle. If someone hands you a crossword puzzle, can you tell me how long it's going to take you to finish it? Probably not. It takes how long it takes. Um, now let's try a crossword puzzle that's as big as this wall. And what Don and I were discussing is, you know, in the old days, you might have, what, 500 maps? Yeah. And these days, with some of the newer bikes, um, the ZX-10 here. This thing has upwards of 1,500 maps. 1,500 maps. So how long is it going to take you to decipher 1,500 crossword puzzles? Now, here's the, here's the part that I think is really interesting. What these crossword puzzles look like. So when we sit here, and, and if we could zoom in on the screen, screen a little bit. So if you've ever used a third-party tuning software, uh, you know, Power Commander software or any of the other guys out there that are flashing the ECUs, you get numbers. Don, if I'm if I'm flashing this and I and I want to give up whatever percent increase um, versus what what exactly are we seeing here? Yeah, this is this is and, uh, throttle position and engine RPM on the axes, and the data that we're looking at right here is the fuel injector fuel injector open time in microseconds. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting to look at. You know, if you see massive color changes and stuff, it, it points out sort of glaring issues. But what most of the time you're going to be looking at is like the percent change, right. like how much fuel you're adding or subtracting, and things like that. So over in this area where we were crazy rich, you can see the you can see the purple. It shows we've made some 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 pretty large changes there, and then some mi uh, more minor changes through the middle just to sort of smooth things out. Now. That's what we understand. That's what my mind understands. Um, but this is because the software allows us to understand that. When we actually start talking about the maps and the code, uh, can you maybe pull up and show us an example of, you know, of the the initial file showing the hex hex code? So when we when you say map, yeah, this is what makes your bike run. Millions and millions of bytes. <laughs> like each one of these numbers is a byte, and there's there's 1.2 million bytes in this ECU, and it just goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Yeah, so it's uh, you know it's a lot of information that's not human readable at all. So so when you when you start off initially with an entirely new model, how do you tell out of all this mountain of goo? What's actually a map that you need to adjust? Is that, uh, is, can you can you do a Google search? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, and it's it's really tough. I mean, we've been doing this for uh, eleven years now. Yeah. We've been we've been hacking the ECUs, and uh, actually about twelve years almost. And you know, as as we do it more and more regularly, we develop tools to automate some of the processes sure. and things that we've done. So you know, like the first time. We tried to find a rev limit in an ECU. It took us like four months. You know, um, now I can find a rev limit in an ECU in about 15 minutes. Nice. You know, so the tools that we use to develop this stuff has has increased quite a bit. But there's been a lot of development in, in making that happen, so we can speed the process up. But it's still a very painstaking process. It's it's uh, 
there's a lot of things that have to be checked and double checked and validated and, and things like that. And it used to be we could do it pretty quick because there was only a couple of field maps, a couple of ignition maps, some rev limits, a speed limiter, and that was pretty much it. But with these new bikes, with all the capabilities they have, with the noise abatement and all the controls, the wheelie control oh, and shit. traction, traction control, control and the launch control and all those sorts of things, it's just, it just compounds more and more and more. And then we have to sort of decipher and it's all woven together too. It's like the traction control system is, is now woven into the actual fuel injection system. Then they, they work in conjunction and possibly and get throttles and everything. And so one of the things we need to emphasize here is uh, a lot of this is happening as, as regulations increase. I mean, I know I've had people that say, hey, you know, I had an 07 Gixxer, now I've got a 2017, my 07 was a lot faster because it didn't have nearly the restrictions. Once you de-restrict the new ones, you get to use all of that engineering technology that the, that, the, that the factories have and have developed. It's amazing the power we can make out of a 1,000cc bike now. But I have to emphasize that as restrictions and as regulations continue to come in, we've had to deal, we're at year 04 now, yeah. year 05 is on the way. Um, it's just gonna make things tighter and tighter and tighter for the OEMs and they can't, they can't ignore it. If they ignore it, they Volkswagen. <laughs> you could Google that. See what happened. See what happened to them with, 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 when there was funny business going on. That's why we really need people like Don in the aftermarket world, and, and you know myself as a tuner to put the components together and allow the, his ability to take the restrictions out to tune the products that we can, that we develop. And the end result is a much faster, smoother bike that is going to get you the kind of results at the racetrack that you want um, depending on where you live if you're in California turn off now you you can't have any of this we won't sell it to you um, but it, it, it's really really interesting and you know we live in a fast food society if my Big Mac doesn't come without onions on it in 30 seconds I'm pissed off well somebody created the Big Mac a long time ago for you to be able to place your order and get it the way you want it now that's what's happening behind the scenes. That's why, and I, and I know Don, we hit the Ninja H2 SX. That that was a real challenge. Yeah. Um, even the Z900 RS, which looks like such a simple motorcycle, has all of the all the same stuff. All the same stuff. Yeah. So anyway, uh, next time you get angry or upset that it's taken a little while, think about uh, all the sweat and tears that are going in on the other side, so that you can smile once that we're finished with everything we're doing. Speaking of finish, can we put this in, see what happens? Sure can. All right, Don, so can we talk about uh, exactly what was done previous to these changes? Were, were the only changes in the uh, in the throttle blades, getting them to open completely, or were, were did you have any other changes previous to what we just did? Yeah, we did some ignition. You can see where they, they pulled out a bunch of ignition timing up top. We, we did fix that at the same time. Because you can't pull to your RPM. Your, to the increased RPM range. What and how much RPM is this increased? It's 500 RPM. 500 over. Yeah, yeah. So so let's get to something that I really need to emphasize. Put red flags up. Put dots. But just because you have the ability to make changes doesn't necessarily mean that you should use them. For example, 500 RPMs in a modern day engine I think is right on the edge of okay we're going to keep stock reliability. What can we change the rev limiter to? You can turn it off. Turn off the rev limiter. <laughs> okay? We can. We can. Right? Yep. We can do it. Yep. But it would end up in instant catastrophic engine failure the minute you weren't quick enough. And believe me, these things are throttled by water for a reason now. It can happen in a split second. So just because you can doesn't mean you should. And that's where the experience comes in with, with what Don's done in the past and my tuning experience. Um, now. What did we just do? Uh, yeah, we basically, we did two things this last go around. Is I wanted to see what the difference was between the stock exhaust servo motor settings mm -hmm. and having it just locked wide open. And uh, we also made some uh, fueling fuel changes. changes. Uh, you know, was specifically that, up Was top. that across the board or was that just in fifth gear? Uh, it was across the board. Across the board. Yeah, okay. yeah. and I did the follows for all gears as well, so no matter what gear we run it in. Um, should have that fully be restricted with the stock setting here. So. When you deal with gentlemen like Don, 
one of the things I noticed, and don't take this the wrong way, Don, you get a lot of should haves. We believe we should have. If you you just saw what he's dealing with. So just because we, we think it should do this doesn't mean that necessarily that it will. And um, well, let's see exactly what happens. I have a couple questions to you because I know um, you fix the flashes, let's say fix. You take the old broken flash out and put your flash in in a lot of instances. And when we get back here after we check this out, I wanna ask you maybe what some of the biggest uh, biggest uh, oopses that you've seen come. Never once ever made a mistake. No. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's see where we're at. We should have, hopefully that rich miss is gone and we can make even more power up top. Let's see what happens. show you something so Don just made a couple more changes to the ECU to sort of fine-tune things here and what I'm going to do uh, we recommend that you cycle your key on and off several times after you put the ECU in now on an H2 after you spend <laughs> hours <laughs> getting this stuff back in and the H2s the new ZX10s the H2SX basically all of them do this now um, they have to re, uh, recalibrate the throttle blades and they do that when you cycle the key um, and you let it cycle completely. I'm impatient so usually I, I try to recycle it before it's finished. But let me show you what happens. I haven't cycled the key on this. I'm going to go ahead and start the bike. cycling the key we're gonna wait how long does it take I, I give it like 15 seconds 15 20 seconds so turn it on for 15 so we're leaving it turned off you good yeah. we'll cycle it you're probably good there little tidbits in flashing so Don made a couple more fuel changes and we're just going to play with it a little bit and then uh, have a discussion after we see what it does. So while we're waiting for this to, to flash, I'll ask 
I'll, I'll, I'll grill Don on some more uncomfortable questions. <laughs> a lot of guys, if you have a problem with your ECU, they get with their third-party software company and they, and that, that company says, listen, you, your only option at this point is to buy a new ECU, reflash it with their software, and start again. Well, you and I both know that you have the ability, we have sent him some, we've helped out some customers, uh, to, I won't call it redo other people's work, but at least be able to unbrick their ECU, save them a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars, and allow them to either have us flash it, or if they want to flash it for somebody else's stuff, at least you can get it back to stop. Why is it that you can do that when these other guys can't? I, I don't know what their capabilities are, can't really. They just, but what we do, there's a, there are several different reasons why these things happen, and we have a lot of tools that we've built to get into ECUs before we know how to read them and things like that to, to reverse engineer them, to, to get into them, to get the code out. And then a lot of those tools were able to go in and read other portions of the ECU where they store information where they store error codes and stuff like that. There are other memory chips there that we have the tools to go in and edit, change, and, and a lot of these like tools that. you've developed. Yeah, they're all so, they're so all the other guys for us just don't yeah. have they don't have those. But, tools. Yeah, or they don't use them that way, or I, I don't know. I don't know what they have or don't have. But um, uh, we we have them, and we're able to go in and actually do a lot of repairing of. of like these error codes that just come up and they don't go away and nobody can make them go away and things like that and I can actually go in and manually go through and, and reset that memory because that's where they're stored. Uh, so there's some of those, there's some that are uh, where there's passwords uh, or, or locks basically that get put on the ECUs and everybody locks them, flash tune, bullets that we do. Everybody locks them in the same way, they're just different numbers, you know combinations to get in and uh, so we're able to get past a lot of those most of them actually um, so some of those are just locked because there's some, some sort of password that we have to go through the process of, of resetting that basically and a lot of these instances we just put these things back to stock and then people can actually use them and it might take an hour two hours or a day or sometimes but uh, you know we can usually get through it and help the customers out sure. and do that that sort of thing but it's it, you have to know a lot about what's going on inside the ECU to actually you know, well, understand I, it. I know we've we've been approached by people with, that have flashed their own ECUs, and of course you're going to have you're going to have operator error, right? With you know, like I said, just because you can do it doesn't necessarily mean you should. And the other thing is, is if you are doing it, you really need to have your head on straight because if you can make individual changes to individual maps and different gears. What if you make a mistake, or what if the software doesn't take that change? Uh, you had told me about a gentleman that I know he had H2 that wasn't running well, and uh, what was what was wrong with his? Uh, we we read the code out to a reverse engineer, and as soon as we fired it up and ran it, I knew something was something desperately was. wrong. And we took one of our ECUs and plugged it in, and it ran just fine. So we knew that the problem was in the ECU. And just out of curiosity's sake, I mean, it was easy to fix. We just reflashed it with the right stuff. Right. But out of curiosity's sake, I wanted to see what was actually wrong, what was actually causing it to run like that. And it turned out that there was like 70-something degrees in one cylinder. Only in one cylinder. Only in one cylinder. 70-something degrees in that one Ignition cylinder. Ignition timing? Yeah. yeah. And I don't know how it got that way. And, you know, the people at the software said, that you couldn't even do that if you tried, but how did it get that way? I don't know. I don't know whether somebody was doing like a copy of somebody else's that made it that way, and I don't know. It's, it's a mystery sometimes how these things end up happening. Do you ever see, do you ever see instances where say the, whoever cracked the initial ECU maybe altered things that shouldn't be altered so even though the customer has the ability to tune specific areas there could be something wrong in the I guess you call it the core of the flash but well, I see some things where like on the H2 especially there's a whole set of throttle maps that are used for detonation uh, instances so basically yeah, I think some people are trying to fight problems with the settings and their throttles are going closed and they understand that they're going closed but they don't know why 
so they go into all the throttle maps and just set them all wide open. And so now so you have these, these, yeah, <laughs> the, you have these throttle maps that are used to close the throttles down if detonation is detected right. to help save the bike. It, you know, they, it also retards timing and things like that. But these are all the safety factors that are built in to the H2 ECU. And I see the, these throttle maps are modified and wide open. And, and so now it's detonating. You're on a land speed run or something. And it's detonating where it would normally start reducing power to save the engine doesn't do that anymore. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I don't know why somebody would actually even edit those maps. Um, you know, the, the way that they do, unless they don't understand what those maps are doing. And then that brings up an excellent point. You know, there's a lot of engineering that goes into this stuff on the front side. So I, I think you you would agree with me. We're not we're not better than the engineers who came up with what they're doing for these bikes. Really the, the object is to you know, loosen the handcuffs that they have instead of recreating the wheel. Right. Um, I, mean, I mean, that's what we do in a lot of the instances. I find that a lot of times it's like the less you do, the, the more you do sort exactly. of thing. It's just like we're not trying to outsmart what the Kawasaki engineers were doing. All we're trying to do is decipher where they've had to make changes to meet certain market criteria and undo those changes versus reinventing the wheel and trying to do something that the bike was never intended to do in the first so place. So le yeah. less is more. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, check these changes out. There you go. And what we're really doing here, guys, is we're just making some simple changes. We're not going to go through all of the painstaking work that it takes to get a flash. The good news is, is that now that Don has the de-restriction section of it done, we have the ability to tune, so we'll go in, we'll tune um, a couple different ways to do it, but we'll do the one that works best, and then we'll end up with an ECU with no flash. I mean, with no, uh, an ECU that doesn't require a power commander, the, fl the flash is built in it, and then uh, for, for us other guys that want to stay all stone axe and, and tune through a power commander, because it really is simple and easy, um, we'll, we'll be able to do that too. So. This is, this is just showing you a little bit of on the surface of what the capabilities are. We've already managed to pick up quite a bit of power through reducing the restriction as well as adjusting the air-fuel ratio to match the restriction. Now, Don, is there any special tuning here that we're all of a sudden going to pick up another 10 horsepower? I doubt it. No. And, and you know, what, what you get is, and, and you and I talked about it previously, the stock map was actually pretty good. Where we're doing the work is in the areas where the stock map doesn't go. Yeah. So if your stock map is, is pretty good, you get rid of the restrictions, what are you going to do to make more horsepower? Well, you've heard it a million times and it's a cliche, but these are nothing but air pumps. So in order to create more horsepower, we're going to have to make physical modifications to the bike to put more air in and get more air out. And by the time we do that, I think this is going to be a it's going to be a strong runner. It's most definitely no joke. It'll be interesting to see what happens. So, I mean, it's already making more power than a fully de-restricted bike three years ago. Oh yeah, ago. yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, yeah. so this is all they, stock. Yeah, they, they did a lot of work and said uh, it's got stock air cleaner, stock exhaust. Now you did open up the uh, butterfly. They're they're staying open, but once we get to making some of the other changes, this. It's no joke. They were serious about getting, uh, you know, making this thing run. The only modifications at this point are electronic. Yeah, yeah, so and basic de basic de restrictions and a little bit of flow or uh, fuel. We got we've got good, really, really good results already. So uh, let's see what we've got here, and then uh, we should be able to wrap it up here pretty soon. Okay.
So you know, this was just a quick and dirty, nothing, nothing special. We just wanted to test the de-restriction flash, did a little hand mapping here, got some really nice gains in the, in the top end here, and, and Don just refresh us. Um, we opened the th throttle blades a little bit more. Uh, you, you stuck the X up valve all the way open, yep. and then uh, we basically made some fuel tuning changes to match the increased RPM mm -hmm. because the bike isn't falling off like I, like it did. Now, just to just to check this out, um, and you know we show this all the time, and it, it, it but it really is it really is amazing. So at right here where the bike quit pulling stock, it made 108 horsepower. Now it makes 181, and it still continues to climb. So without changing anything else on this bike in that area we're looking at 75 horsepower <laughs> gain um, plus we've got another 500 that lets it keep pulling so when it drops back off um, you can see here where the bike's pulling because you know like I said we didn't change anything up through the middle but once it starts falling off um, wow it's just going to be a completely different motorcycle and we haven't even played with the other gears. Um, we're, we've, we've got plenty of work left to do. It's hot. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and uh, we're gonna go ahead and call it a day on this. But we'll still be continuing to tune behind the scenes. I, and like I said, I just wanted to, to point out to you things that that may be different about this bike. Don's tuning technique and his methods with the Mortify is most definitely different. If you've ever used any of the other guys' stuff. Uh, it can be a little, uh, you can do so much, it can, it can really sort of make your head spin. You guys have, have done an amazing job. We haven't gotten into any of the user resets, diagnostic patches. I mean, there's just all kinds of work that still needs to be done, but we will at least have a stock, a stock engine de-restriction flash here very soon. Then we'll move on to slip-ons, full systems. Sprint filters. Um, I can tell you what this this thing is from a power standpoint. It's going to give Jixilla a real run for its money. There's there's no doubt that uh, that somebody is home here in this engine. So it's going to be uh, interesting to see what happens. Don, thanks for making the trip out there. That was uh, that was Always fantastic fun. on your part. And I uh, hope you guys learned something. And we'll be back with additional changes here shortly. And until then, I'm Brock from Brock's Performance, Don Gould from Gould Motors. We'll see you then.